Oh, you made it! You're finally here! Welcome to Half Cocktails, a place where we have a great time celebrating science, the social contract, and just plain old congeniality. Dare I say a place where we seek a path to peace, prosperity, and exploration amongst the stars. What I'm talking about is an all-inclusive society, meaning if you're not on board with the social contract, we're not obligated to even consider your opinion, because the social contract is that damn important to society. I'm your friend and host, Dan, the worshipping Dionysus man, sipping on some scientists today. Joining me, the wonders professor, whom you all know, as well as my beautiful, lovely, talented, amazing sister, Amber. How are you both doing today? Oh, doing great. Cheers. Do go on. <laughs> go on. All right. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> uh, and, and just so everybody's aware, what we're going to do here when we discuss the Mormon church is we're going to kind of walk through my and Amber's experience of growing up in the church and blossom that into uh, what what the church is is doing and is about and uh, the founder, Joseph Smith, and where it came from, how there came to be a church. And we'll get in some of those juicy nuggets of bullshit that are factually, verifiably uh, pointing to this, this church is, and it's not legit. Sorry, apologies to those who believe it is, but it's not. Amber, uh, do you recall having a choice being kids? Oh, I totally had a choice, but I was eight years old. Yeah, was, yeah. You so you learn you learn nothing up till eight. Right, right, right. When I was eight, right, I was right. given the choice. Of course, you know, because all eight year olds have the capacity to make lifelong decisions. Yeah. She's referring to Mormon baptism, and that happens at the age of eight. We'll get there later. I did actually think of that today, Amber. Like, <laughs> that specifically, like, and they, and they brainwashed me to believe it was my choice. Yep. yep. Who at eight years old is going to say to their parents, no, I'm out? Not the ones that are raised to say yes, that's for sure. What's the contrary? What do you, what's, what does no get you? What's no get you? I'll tell you, because I know. Because my, me and my brothers, I don't know, Amber, you were o- older, and, and I don't remember you ever saying no. Uh, 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 but when we said no to church, we got in trouble. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We weren't allowed to say no to church. You- I was threatened to be drugged to church in my pajamas if I didn't get yep. dressed. I remember that. Like, get dressed. No. Well, then you're going in your pajamas. So that's public humiliation. <laughs> you have. Like, it wasn't an empty threat. Yeah, the threat of public humiliation. One day, as a 13-year-old, I decided to pretend like I was so asleep, my father couldn't wake me for church. <laughs> and he put ice cubes on my back. <gasps> wow. Oh. Good lord. Oh, that yeah. sounds really funny if it's not in that context. Don't worry. I sat there and let the ice cube st- let the ice melt oh, into geez. my back completely. <laughs> and then as soon as it was water, I went into my mom's to mom's room and said, Mom, my back really hurts. I just woke up in a lot of pain. And I had, I had welts. I mean, yeah. I had, you know, a little frozen rash sores. And uh, uh, so, you know, she chewed him out. (laughs) And then you went to church. (laughs) Did you get to, did you have to go to church or did you get to stay home? I honestly, uh, she put a bandage on it, made me go to church. (laughs) Of course. You weren't dying, so... I think everybody has a good idea of the tone of today's show. Yeah, so if you're not up with our vibe, you probably ought to find another show today. No, 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 no. Or listen, so you get the truth. That's specifically why you should listen to the end, because you're a true believer. Nothing, no joke I could make could rattle your cage and shake your faith. Your faith is strong. Come on in. That's true. Stick around. I can't possibly challenge any of your beliefs. You're one with God. Great. Good for you. Uh, I'll tell you, though, (laughs) my introduction to the Mormon church, the very first time I can remember the church is very fuzzy because when you're born into it, you're taken as a baby. Yeah. Right. And I don't know about other churches, but the Mormon church has a nursery. Mm hmm. Where if you need to, like, drop your baby for a bit, like, you don't get a babysitter. You don't stay at home with your kid. You come to church. 
and there's a support at that church to 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 take care of that child. Oh, you need diapers, you need milk, you need formula. We got it. Amber, do you remember uh, taking your kids to nursery? Well, yeah, nursery is actually a little bit different than a lot of other Christian churches. So it's not just like you drop your kid off and they play and they get babysat. So nursery in the Mormon church starts when you're 18 months old. You're not allowed to take your kid to nursery unless you stay with them. Then sometimes they'll let you in. Okay. Where do the women with the crying newborns go when they step outside? Um, Because I've never done that. The mother's lounge or just the hallway. um, If they're really bad outside, if they won't settle. there's there's a specific place to go when you have like a six week. Old. Yeah, yeah. Most churches have like a mother's lounge that'll have okay. a squishy chair that you can like nurse in and a changing table, and it always smells okay. really yucky too. By the way, of course, um, who's cleaning it? But yeah, no. Nursery is more than just babysitting. It's an actual class for eighteen months to three years old, and they uh, do church songs. So they put. 18 month old mm-hmm. babies into religion class. Yep. Yeah, they they do have snack time and we have song time. But there's also a 5 to 10 minute lesson about, you know, God or the earth and how the earth was created. Very very basic teachings. But there's a lesson every week and you pretty much, as a, because I worked in the nursery a few times, as a nursery mm-hmm. teacher, you pretty much just, like, say your spiel because, well, let's face it, they're not at a cognitive age where they're going to understand what you're saying. But their subconscious hears it. Yep. It's a training mechanism. It gets you ready to go to primary where you're going to learn all the lessons. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very, very familiar with that. I don't have conscious memories of of nursery, but uh, I do have like my my memory kicks in around four. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that's that's different for everybody, um, and but by the age of four, there was a clear delineation between the world on TV and church world. Mm-hmm. The world outside mm-hmm. that little uh, house on Beckalow Avenue. Oh yeah, that we were living yep. in. It was all, all I can remember is the backyard because we had the tree and the swing set mm-hmm. and, and the house, right? Anything that it, that was all con- in my world considered part of church, right? Because we were so, well, we're all good believers here in this family. Yes. We love God here. Yes. We, we, we pray five times a day. We're, we're reading scriptures together and doing all the family church time. And then we go. Yep. So every, every week, you know, I was, I was well aware of that, but I already knew I was already knew by then, by the time I can remember that, uh, that TV world was not our world. And there was a very real us versus them already integrated into my circuitry. Very much so. Uh, Very much. The world is out to get us. We are a persecuted people. Oh yeah, that that's, that's that's all the way back in Mormon history. Yeah. All the stories are of, of them being persecuted and they never ever tell the other side. I mean, it's I I don't want to say it's Jew envy, but uh you know. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly was thinking it pretty loud. I actually wasn't bummed out about that because to me it was like I you know when, like any child, any normal child believes their parents. If their parents aren't actively abusing them, uh, fit, like physical abuse, like sexual abuse, it, it, I, if there's if if they're just not abusing them, generally kids at that age are going to believe their parents when they tell them. Right. That's why so many kids believe Santa's real, mm-hmm. right? Right. Like hey. you, be- as a kid, believe. <laughs> so I believed that we're members of the true church mm-hmm. and. And therefore, everything's fine for us. Yep. Like, we're persecuted, but God's looking out for us because we're true believers. God has our back. Okay. He's got our back. And that, that's such a pattern. The, the need to be persecuted is such a pattern amongst religions. Uh, the wilder, the more it happens. And then and cults. What, what's up with that? What, what is so... What do you think is so helpful to the... It seems like manipulation is some kind. 
Well, it absolutely is manipulation. It's it's how you cement a community together. I mean, think of how America, you know, after 9-11, we all came together. And for a few days anyway, we all loved each other. Yeah. It's that same kind of mentality. I had a flag on my car. Right? Right? It's that same kind of mentality. If it if you're being persecuted, it bonds you. It's kind of a trauma bond in a lot of ways, too. Like, you're bonded together in a cause. Yeah. Also, it provides a very easy shield and blanket for, oh, did uh, did your friends try and convince you that this church is right. not real? Mm-hmm. Yeah, figures. Yep. We're getting attacked everywhere. That's just them attacking you, man. You should probably question why they feel s- such a strong need to convince you you're wrong. They're probably coming from a place of hurt and despair. And maybe you can be a better better uh, right. friend to them and, and get them to some yeah. churches, classes, uh, help teach them better. Right. Because that is what they need. Do they know, like, does ever, do people that do this, do they know they're doing it? That's the thing. It's like it seems like all of the little, the little capos, all the little elders and stuff, do the play the the same playbook as the people who actually benefit from it. I I honestly think most of the people in it today don't realize what they're doing. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I don't think they have any idea. You remember the study where uh, they had. Uh, it was some silly psychology study where it was like the first subject goes into a room of participants and like a, a buzzer goes off and all the participants stand up, mm-hmm. continue doing whatever they're doing, reading mm-hmm. a book, looking on a phone, talking to each other. And then, and then five seconds later, sit down and slowly they take out participants and put in more subjects until it's all subjects. Yep. And they're still, they, they're standing when the, when the buzzer goes off. Not a single person in there knows why. I think that's the effect in the Mormon church. It, it absolutely is. That's how most cults operate, is through that peer pressure. You know, raise your hand if you've been through this um, experience, you know, and then you look around and you're like everybody's raising their hand. I guess I'll raise mine too. I, I think I may have been on the younger side for this, but uh, uh, going through the narrative of my own introduction and knowledge of the church, Uh, The first time I remember bearing my testimony, which is church speak for talking about how I don't have feelings the church is true, how I have a direct knowledge of the truth of the church and religion. (laughs) And that was at the age of five. Because you feel it. Your knowledge comes from your feelings. Right. It made perfect sense to me as a five year old. Oh, yeah. I stood up in front of the entire congregation because once a month, that's that's the church meeting. It's everybody starting with the the church, the the local leaders. They bear their testimony. They all give a short improv talk, completely improv. Everybody. It's not pre-written. An improv talk about all the reasons they know, not believe, they know that church is true. Yep. Okay. Age of five, I'm up in front of the congregation. I'm doing this. Why? Well, not just because I believe it as a five-year-old, but implicitly, I know this is something everyone in this congregation will love. They're going to enjoy it. They're going to give me praise and I'm going to feel good. I'll feel special and I'll feel like I belong, like I'm part of the group. I'm going to get up and participate yeah, too. I feel, I feel it. I feel it. So what, what strikes, I have another, like that, that just hit me hard because they need to do this. Like this is, I, I've been mm-hmm. to a couple of, just for history's sake, um, I dated a Mormon in college for about a year and went to church with her. And, and I was mostly just very curious about it all. I never believed it, but I told them that I did. And I don't know why, because they wouldn't have had any different feelings <laughs> either way. I just felt like I would make them feel bad if I told them what I believed. I felt like, oh, I don't want to hurt this person's uh-huh. feelings. <laughs> but the testimony was huge. It's a huge part of of. Church, church part one of three, I guess I would call it. Every Sunday, it was like the three. <laughs> um, 
But what strikes me now is like, that feels very opposing to the concept of faith. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is like, they even, you know, you'll even have little kids come up whose parents tell them what to say. And if you think about it Mm -hmm. with anything in life, the more you say it, the more you believe it. Mm. So testimony meeting is just to continue that brainwashing for lack of a better word to where you're constantly repeating and hearing these messages on a regular basis. And so they're sinking into your subconscious, whether you want them to or not. And you do believe because that's what you've programmed yourself to do. Uh, Alex, I want to, I want to circle back to uh, uh, you, you saying that that's counter to faith, but, but, before I do, I want to say, do you remember Sin- that band Sinister Mustard? <laughs> yeah, I sure do. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a shame I like their music so much because they were weird. Anyway, <laughs> their the, their front man was Mormon. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And and I was like, I thought it was going to be a bonding thing. Like, hey, we both made it out, but uh, uh, he was like on a rumspringa kind of thing. Oh, like one of one of one of his bandmates was like, hey, dude, he still like believes he just wants to, you know, fuck. Uh huh. But I remember saying that to him after that, when when he got upset, because I kept saying anti-Mormon things. I was like, look, any church that once a month has parents march their kids up in front of the group and whispers in their ear what to say about how true the church is. Mm hmm. Is a brainwashing factory. You cannot get around yeah. that. Nope. Uh, which is which was to Amber's point. But uh, uh, I would like to I would like to hear you expound, please, on what you mean by that's contrary to faith. This this testimony. Well, I mean, it just seems like if you have faith, then you have it. Uh, you you don't need this constant. You don't need to constantly say it. You just have it. It's just like security in re- in a relationship. It's the people who are insecure who keep saying, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you still love me? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, every week I like to have a little meeting where I talk about how I know gravity is real. <laughs> <laughs> do you know or do you believe? Just this week, <laughs> I dropped a book on my foot. <laughs> hey, that's really good. Self mutilation to remind yourself of your faith. That'll do it. A little pain can be your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And you've got—I mean, you've got that special thing, Dan. Where I, and I'm so glad that you're not a cult leader, um, because you, <laughs> you would be bad. It would be bad. But it turns out you're a good, really good person. Um, so it's, uh, uh, some would say it wasted talent, you. but, um, you have, you have the power to, t- I think you should put that in your back pocket. Dan. <laughs> I know it more than you, buddy. I know it more than you. <laughs> if I didn't have the empathy of, of being like, Oh, but then they got ripped off. <laughs> you would make uh, an excellent cult leader. Just saying. Oh, thank you. There was a, hey, there was a comedian uh, of of Indian descent who, like, as a comedic bit, he like grew his beard and hair out and pretended to be a, a guru and started a cult. Oh, uh, and then he had to disband it because it got all too fucking real. And he was like, <laughs> all I was doing was giving them the most basic, like, love one another, <laughs> appropriate apropisms, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Ap- apophisms, whatever the fucking word is. Uh, uh, and, and, yeah, and doing so in an accent <laughs> and in the presentation of I'm a master, yeah. people ate it up. They he got real followers and it scared him and he had to like shut the whole thing down. Oh wow. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to do that. I do feel like uh getting people to gather with me every week on a podcast should slowly grow into my vision of a modern religion. <laughs> So I'll, I'll go ahead and say that now. <laughs> uh, well, you know, yeah. I tune in every week, so. <laughs> Aw, I love you too. Aww. So yeah, five years old's when I started. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
by the time I would say of 10, even the introverted kids would do it. At least once. Right? Yeah. At least once. The pressure was so great. You want to make your mom and dad happy and proud of you, so you do it. I can remember in church as a teenager and paying attention to who didn't bear their testimony that was another like teenage uh, guy. Oh yeah. And and hanging out with them and being yeah. like like mom, I'm going over to Mike's house, you know, from church. <laughs> <laughs> See, you did it the right way, whereas most people look around and think, oh my gosh, so-and-so did not get up. I wonder what's going on. I wonder if they did something this week that they got in trouble yeah. for. Like, why aren't they getting up to give their testimony? The gossip of churches. It's not, I mean, we, we saw the Mormon version, but it's true in, in any church. But when you draw those lines of this is right, this is wrong. Everybody's going to talk about everybody else and how good they're doing. Yep. And weirdly, the better they're doing, the more people just think of things they probably are doing. Right. <laughs> there's, there's no winning that gossip game. Yep. It's also really tough to get people's motivations out of their behaviors. I went to church. We didn't believe in anything. We were still went to church because we wanted to um, get closer to the my mom's sister and her kids, our cousins. We just w went so that we could have some kind of way to hang out with them. Um, and none of us believed <laughs> in it. Uh, I even went to confirmation because I thought that I would meet girls. <laughs> nice. Class. Did, did you? Yeah. They were um, not <laughs> interested. <laughs> yeah. But it was still, like, it was a highly social thing. And I I learned like a little bit of history I could pluck out of there. Like I, it was, I learned about Martin Luther. And then when that came up in high school history, it was like, Oh yeah, I've heard, I've heard about him. And then it was nice. I, I was always just sort of collecting data. Cause I knew at a very young age that I, that none of those stories felt like they meant anything. I don't even remember believing in Santa. I have no memory of believing in Santa. Yeah. I, I definitely did and was really embarrassed and didn't ever want to admit it once I figured out the truth. So weird how people enjoy, I don't know, lying to kids. Uh, look how gullible they are. <laughs> they don't understand enough about the world to, to completely reject the idea of Santa Claus. Oh, there is something to be said about childlike innocence. Like, and I don't think it's necessarily inherently with? bad that we believe these things or tell our kids these things it's when we hang on to them and and it's stop true. realizing that they're not true that we enter a really dangerous right. part of life mm -hmm. when you frame it like that i i think I, I i get get your point very well and it's a it's a it's a really good point in that if we as society have a benchmark for innocence and it's like, you're going to pass this line and you're going to realize Santa isn't real. But let's keep the line there so the innocent can stay innocent until they grow up. And let that be the marker for you on when you stuck your head up from the ground and looked around. Right. If, if we use Santa as a, a, a moral journey for our, our maturity, I, I'm, I'm all for it. It's not used that way sadly uh and the the but it's the same innocence that we talk about when we talk about you believe the religion you're raised up in right you do that's where you start i very few kids start from like like alex i believe alex is the kind of person like like that would be skeptical of santa from day one right like a man does what uh, but that's the exception to the yeah. rule, right? Most people don't start there. Right. Uh, some people do. Uh, uh, I didn't start there. I know that for, for a fact. And I was a really bright kid. I passed a lot of tests as a kid. Uh, 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 still believe Santa. It's an emotional decision, right? It's, it's not. 
Absolutely. It's not a logical decision, uh, just like like religion is. And and at the age of eight, you're given this choice in the Mormon church. You're not given a choice. They tell you, oh, it's eight. So now you get to choose whether or not to join the church. So we've scheduled your baptism for this day. (laughs) Right? You're eight. You don't set up when it happens. But there's a big ceremony. People from church show up. Your family shows up. You're any... You you are encouraged to invite anybody you can because it's seen as a hook to like get people interested. <clears throat> I don't ever ever recall anybody saying, "All right, little Danny, here is the moment." Do you believe this church is true or not? But they say that they do that. You you do have to interview with your bishop even at eight years old to be to be baptized. And he, he does ask questions about your testimony, but what else are you supposed to say? Like, this what, is the expectation a- in your family is that when you turn eight, you're going to be baptized. So, of course, you're going to say you believe what your parents have taught you is true your whole life. What else do you say? My experience was being brought into the bishop's office and him saying, so I understand you want to be baptized. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And I went, uh, yes. Yeah? <laughs> he says, that's so wonderful to hear. It's been scheduled for this day. Uh, I have to ask you these questions. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm so glad to hear that we've already got it sorted. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, she goes down and checks all the boxes. It's the same psychological kind of trickery as when I, when I worked uh, for, for a certain bookstore and I call, was calling in sick early in the morning. The boss, he answers the phone and he goes, hey, it's the bookstore. Thanks for not calling in sick. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, yep. it's like you, you, they put the onus on you. Right. Yes. Right? And, and when you're a child versus not just an adult, but a, an authority figure, mm-hmm. a a bishop to an eight-year-old is like going in front of a judge. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Okay? Or the fucking mayor. Like, what the fuck is this? This right. dude's important. Yeah. You don't say no. So, you get baptized. And here's and here's how even worse. Like, so I don't know if you're aware, because you left the church uh, much earlier in life than I did. Um, and I raised my kids in the church. And so when you and I were growing up, baptism was kind of a really individual thing. Like I got baptized with a friend of mine, but that was like a choice we made. We wanted to be baptized together. Were your birthdays close? Yeah, we had close birthdays. We both were turning eight in the same month. Um, So we got baptized on the same day, which was unusual back in 70s and 80s. But now we have stake baptism day and that's the day that all the eight-year-olds from the congregation area that's made up of several congregations all the eight-year-olds come together and get baptized on the same day so it's kind of like what? factory line almost i mean you each have your own little room for talks and things like that but the initial meeting is all together in the chapel before you break wow. off for the individual baptisms. So now wow. you have that extra pressure of, well, my all my other friends at church that are turning eight are getting baptized on Saturday, mom and dad. I want to be baptized too. Mm-hmm. Literally bandwagoning it. Everyone's going. Yep. Ah! Damn. I didn't think they could improve, but that, That's yeah. Better. Oh, wow. yeah. Getting better and better. All the time, let me tell you. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, so at that age, primary, once a week, we're going to school, mm-hmm. right? And, and as Alex alluded to, there are three rounds of church. Now, it, I do know, because our, our brother Jared was bitching about it before his demise, uh, uh, they shrunk it. They've shrunk it from the three hours to two, I think. Yes. Now it's two hours. When, so when I was growing up, it was, so this is how church was when I was little. We went to 
Sunday school or sacrament meeting in the morning. And then there were a few hours we'd go home and then we would come back for the other meeting. And then primary was in the week, during the week on a weeknight. So we had our church times broken up. It was still three hours, but it wasn't three in a block. So I remember when we went to the block schedule and that was like, whoa, like this is three hours of church on a Sunday. And then a few years ago, I'm thinking maybe five ish or so six ish. Um, I've been out for about seven years now, so I'm not like, I just pick up on things that I read. Um, but now it's a two hour block and they alternate between Sunday school one week and priesthood and relief society, the men's and women's meetings on the second week. Oh, so what, what she, yeah. And, and, and Alex, I'm assuming that's what you were used to because that's what I was used to was all of that happened on one day. So you would Mm -hmm. go as a child, you go to an hour of all of the kids together in one room Mm -hmm. ages. What what was it? Six ages, whatever. No, Sunbeam start at three. Three to three three is primary. Okay. The age of three, once you're out of nursery, Mm -hmm. from the age of three up till 12, you're you're all in one room together and you have this shared lesson with singing, religious songs. Mm-hmm. Reading uh, the the scriptures together, uh, Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and not only not only the Book of Mormon, but another book they call the Doctrine and Covenants, and another book they call the Pearl of Great Price. You, you all those right. are what is in a set of Mormon scripture, mm-hmm. right? So, so you're going to have lessons and readings from all of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you break for a few minutes to use the bathroom and get a drink of water or whatever, and you go into classes that are divided by age. Correct. So the three, three-year-olds, or is it three and four? I think it's every year's its own, right? Every year is its own, but sometimes yeah. they have to combine to get enough kids in a class. Yeah, if there aren't enough kids, they'll combine them. But best case scenario, every year is its own classroom with its specific lessons and, and a teacher. Now, mm-hmm. this this is doubly insidious as an adult looking back. It's not only brainwashing the kids, but those teachers oh, yeah. aren't being paid. Nope. Those are those are church members that are that that are quote unquote called, like they're kind of told, like, hey, we want you to do this. Will you do this? Now they could say no, but it's like yeah. saying no to your baptism. Right. <laughs> there are there are there's social consequences to saying no. Right. You can say no. Yeah, they don't like it when you say no. I've done it a few times. <laughs> you can say no a couple times. You can do it a couple times because it's extenuating circumstances. Mm-hmm. But if you're if you become a pattern knower, you become shunned. Because mm-hmm. you're not pulling your weight. Our mother's health. Oh God, yeah. Slowly drug her down to where she became a chronic knower. And I yeah, watched I her reputation in the church suffer. Ugh. Yep. She had fucking breast cancer and was dying. She was a true blue believer and a fucking hard worker. In her prime, yep. she ran that place. Yep. Literally. When I was a kid, my dad was a bishop and his wife ran the place. Yep. I know he ran, she ran his shit because I watched her do it my whole life. <laughs> right? Yep. Anyway. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, it's really sad. You can't, you can't, so you can say no a couple times, but you, so, so if you want to have the the social standing and be part of the group to Mm -hmm. succeed and be, be true to your quote unquote self, to be true to everything, you have to say yes. And when you're the one telling all the little kids, this is what we believe, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. Something I didn't bring up earlier. uh, There's a very real psychological effect. Mm -hmm. When you are speaking to a group and you say something, you it it hooks and hardwires uh, into your subconscious. Hey, yep. If I'm going to be true to myself, I now have to back this up. Cognitive dissonance. 
I just told a group of people uh, this is mm-hmm. the truth, then I, <laughs> I really need to make sure that's the truth. Right. Uh, it's, it's, I, and I came across that in the same book that taught me about why everybody started to hate the Hare Krishnas in the 70s. Mm-hmm. They were using a trick where in the airports, they would give you a flower and the human psyche says, you just gave me a gift. I have to return the favor somehow. Mm-hmm. Right. And then they followed that fucking here, take this flower from me with, Hey, join my fucking religion. In so many words. They're always trying to give me the <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Here, here's a book. Let me give you a free book. Yes. Free book. Cause it, cause it works. It's uh, in, in, and I, I should probably look up which book that was and put it in the episode description. I highly recommend uh, reading up on human psychology for your own sake. Everyone listening, uh, it, it, it only makes you better able to identify things that are happening in life and, and ha- in the ways that we're manipulated and taken advantage mm-hmm. of. Absolutely. And I say that because, and sadly, it's the same, it's the same shit people use the same awareness people use to manipulate. Uh, it's the same reason why I would recommend women read like Robert Greene's Art of Seduction. Like, learn that dark side bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like, do- doesn't matter if you if you learn it where where you learn it. Like, it's out there. This information's out there, and people are using it to fuck with you. Mm. Yep. It, it, it's it's almost to the point where like I, I wonder if, if this should be what's in public school. It definitely should be what's in uh, um, any religious school I set up. Like, oh, what are we going to teach three-year-olds? Let's teach them uh, how mi- humans are manipulated and how to spot <laughs> the truth. That's what I want to teach three-year-olds. Yeah. I wouldn't hold my breath. Critical thinking skills are not the focus of today's public educational system. Just just putting that out there. We tried to. I tried to, to make that a thing. Oh. Yeah, high school. Well, Trust me, I try all the time. That's right. You're both teachers. We are. I, I can. I. I can tell you. I. I think it's a confluence of factors that nobody could have had any con- control of. And, and and what we're we're talking about is how, like, we're here talking about the Mormon faith and how Amber, okay. you and I were were pipelined through this belief system right. and it formed it formed our young selves that we had to recover from uh, exactly. uh, uh, because it's relevant i'm short short circuiting and and foreshadowing the the end but uh, uh the the fact of the matter is that the the youth today growing up with the internet in instead of social interaction like i saw it at the hotel with the young kids i was hiring like some of them have critical thinking skills, mm-hmm. right? Like because they were born with them, they were they were born with a mi- an inquisitive mind. Like like Darwin, when you go back over his biography, like he came from a family of like inquisitive, curious people. Like, what do you think that means, son? Like, like you need your own experiences to figure shit out, right? Like right. like those people are always going to exist. Uh, uh, but this digital world of social media and echo chambers Mm -hmm. has made i i feel like like the youth today there there were there were conflict de-escalations i did at the hotel here that the younger kids were like literally like how did you do that that lady was yelling and screaming and then you went and talked to her and she was fine (laughs) they looked at me like i had magic powers it's like holy fuck. Okay, okay. Well, I guess this is why I'm the boss. Well, gather around, <laughs> kids. Let let me teach you about what it's like to feel angry. Okay, so if you feel angry, the person you're talking to, how based on what they do, you're either going to feel more angry or less angry. What are ways you think will make you feel less angry if you're talking to me about something you're angry about? And then light bulbs started going off in their fucking head. Right. Like, Holy shit. Like, I, part, part of me, part of me when I left the hotel was thinking like, oh, what are these poor kids going to do now that I'm not around to mentor them? 
Well, you know, there's, I mean, the, the internet is that double-edged sword, right? We've got kids that are growing up on it that are not learning the critical thinking skills in an environment where they're even more important than they ever were. Yeah, yeah. But on the other, on the flip side, it's the fact that we've got this internet set up and we do have access to all this information that's helping people who are looking or are trying mm-hmm. to think for mm-hmm. themselves. It's helping them find the answers, i.e. the Mormon church. Like before the internet, I wouldn't have probably even left the church if it wasn't for the fact that the internet allowed information to be shared that was not shared by the church itself. And if you came across it, they would tell you, no, 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 that's an anti-Mormon lie. They're lying to get you to leave the safety yeah. of the church. Yeah. I, uh, 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 we'll, we'll, uh, let's, let's, let's head, let's head towards how we got out of the church. Cause it's, it's not important to share the details. Uh, beyond what we've shared. Uh, I don't want to get any church doctrines beyond that, but uh, 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 I myself left after a car accident. Like I, Ron and I were just talking about integrity and having your thoughts, words, and actions all line up, Mm -hmm. right? Like, like I lived a life where uh, uh, before I left the church, my, my thoughts, words, and actions didn't line up. I did not have integrity as a woman. I didn't. In a church that preaches integrity. Yes, yes. Ironically. But because, because I found my true self wanting to go off and, and have these conversations and discussions and actions with friends who weren't church members. And my family identity of who I was around mom and dad and you and all of my brothers and sisters and nie- nieces and nephews and, and people I knew from church was a, a Mormon guy. Mm-hmm. And they were... They they were they were fighting. They were always at odds. Right. Right. And it wasn't until I had a car accident where I I realized how fragile life is. I lost a big chunk of brain uh to brain damage. Right. Uh there you know, there's memories that I'll just never get back. Uh, uh I was disassociated from my memories and emotions and, and started looking. I actually started reading the Book of Mormon because it was, you know, obviously I wasn't I wasn't ignorant to the fact that the family was Mormon. And then like my mom, you know, mom was like, you want to come to church with us? We'll come pick you. We'll pick you up. And I was like, sure. Right. And I'm like sitting in like, like post injury, Dan, like, this is kind of weird guys. <laughs> anyway, I started to read that book of Mormon and I came across, uh, uh, two things that were immediately non-starters for me. And that was in the beginning of the book when he comes across the drunk dude passed out in the ditch mm. and and god's like kill that guy and he's like i don't know and god's like you gotta fucking kill that guy so you can pretend to be him to to re- reclaim your fucking family treasures to go and get the word of god that was yeah yeah on gold plates family treasures including the gold plates with the word of god right right and i remember reading that uh post brain injury trying to being disassociated with the the brainwashing of my youth and and it was just like dan you have a moral compass Mm -hmm. read this book and use it and i got to that part and i went wait a minute wait what murder this man okay first of all you can't cut off a man's head and then steal his clothes. That is fucking ludicrous. Yeah, it doesn't really work in real life. You fail just Dan's movie critic. Like, <laughs> I can't believe this film. Right? Movie critic Dan would not allow anything further. Exactly. And second of all, the morals in my heart says, if all you need to do is look at him, only a petty child god would set demand that guy's death. Right. And take away because because people have to understand the whole root of this. And and this isn't just Mormon religion. The whole root of religion is we're going to be judged by uh, our on our behaviors by a God. Okay, being judged by our behaviors means the longer you live, the more opportunities you have to turn around, become a good person and do good. That's all what Christianity is all about. Mm -hmm. That that repentance, right? 
that forgiveness. So God saying, kill this man, is God saying, I don't want to give him any more opportunities to turn around and do right. So I actually consider that personally to be a bit of a moral paradox that the Mormons box themselves in, in like the very first part of the book. Oh, absolutely. And if God didn't want him to live anymore, why didn't God just take him? Why did he have to have somebody else kill him? Right. And commit murder. Just didn't, just didn't sit right with me. Uh, uh, also, the, the whole, the whole shtick that the Mormons do with the, uh, uh, they believe there was a war in heaven, mm-hmm. with Lucifer falling. Mm-hmm. And, and yet, and I was taught by many different people that no unclean, unpure thing could be in God's presence or be destroyed. Right. On top of, we're only here to make moral decisions, to be judged. To prove we're worthy. And so I, so I took those three things and I put them together and went, how can Satan make a moral choice, make it wrong, and survive in God's face when we're only making moral choices down here on earth? That's the whole reason we had to leave heaven, you t- fucking told me, you goddamn dipshits. So I, I I honestly hit those points and was like, okay, no, it's done. It's done. And 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 that for me, uh, I, I believe the, the ex-Mormons call it, that's what broke my shelf. Yes. Uh, I broke it. I broke it when I sit on it because I said, this should hold my weight. Boom. No, it didn't. <laughs> the great analogy. I, I am very glad that the internet today provides a much easier and simpler path uh, than, than I had back then. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, 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 and let's, let's dive into some of that, because I think that's the real meat of anybody who's listened to us this long. You, you, want, you want the, the goodies on, like, what's the, what's the buffoonery of this church? Like, what, what's the <laughs> bullshit, crazy things Mormons believe? Oh, God, we'd need another three or four episodes for that. Uh, uh, Let's see if we can do it in 20 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So there's this guy named Joe Smith. And the first entries into the history book of Joseph Smith, beyond his birth certificate, were his arrest record. Yes. Uh, And uh, seems old Joe was involved and running around with a couple of rocks that he called seer stones, that if he lined them up kind of like a telescope, he could see into the ground. <gasps> and, and, and if you pay him enough, he'll go over all your property and tell you if there's any buried Indian treasure. Ooh. That native, those Native Americans and their buried gold and silver. Ha <laughs> ha. There, it's everywhere, and I can tell you where. If you hire me, it's going to take a while because you know I got to go. These these stones are small. I got to go every every inch of your acreage. Right, right. Oh, and I pay charge by the hour. No, wait, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know not how he uh, set up his fees, but it wasn't cheap. But uh, there, but eventually, it did go to court, and he was ordered to pay restitution to the his former employer and stop scamming people and to stop stop scamming people uh that that absolutely happened that's in the record you can go look that up yourself not only court records but newspaper records uh uh also joseph smith was doing this amidst the backdrop of uh what would they call it the the great this is the religious revolution of the time is that what you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's actually like a name for it in history books. I'm trying to... So this all happened during a period called the Great Awakening. Ah. And that was uh, a series of events and, and, and common occurrences uh, that, that kind of shaped the religious landscape and, and in the U.S., especially in the Northeast. Uh, uh, we had traveling preachers, revival tents, Mm -hmm. camp meetings. Uh, Everybody was having revelations from God and saying, come, come hear me talk and join my. This is the true church. No, this is, this is the, this is the true (laughs) church. Yes. Like, like Joseph Smith is, is the, the one, he was the all-star of this group. Okay. He definitely cornered the market. 
he cornered the market. Like of, of all of the churches that were started during this great awakening and all of the preachers that grew followers, he was the one to have the biggest impact, right? Yep. He's the one that did grew, grew the best and had it into perpetuity so far, right? Points for longevity. Longe- long- Oh, I can't say that word. Longevity. Yeah. There were That's- plenty of Baptists and evangelicals. Like their churches still survive today, but they've they've been, you know, they join like the greater group to be the Right. To make themselves even more legitimate, right? To to fight Catholicism. Uh so so there are plenty that has survived today, but they're part of other denominations. Of distinct churches, I, I honestly off the top of my head don't know of any others. That survived it certainly did not thrive like the the Mormon LDS Church did. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. That's worth looking so, at. So, so he he wasn't even unique in him saying God gave me a personal revelation saying this is this is the way. Right. Right. He was unique in he created a, a whole new branch, and a- after his arrest with these seer stones. Uh, and and I think it's funny. One of the Christian apologist pages I was reading was actually taking your logic through as like like I believe the church because J- Joseph couldn't possibly be doubting himself here. Like where did where did the book come from? Like he couldn't he wouldn't have had the time to write it anyway. It really make me really made me laugh. Oh, good grief! Time's all he had at some point, and and. I honestly don't know if he had like epilepsy and like just like had these fits and believed his shit or not. I don't know. But what I do know is it came from him, not uh, some sort of deity or, or angels. I think eventually he had to have, like we talked about earlier, the more you say it, the more you believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like just like Hitler at one point would scream like the hand of God protects the Fuhrer because he would survive a bomb attempt. Mm hmm. Like, I feel like at some point, like, that became Joseph Smith. He's like, I've been this successful. Mm-hmm. Like, something's, something's going on. Mm-hmm. Fucking doing great. So he goes from, you know, trying to get money from a single rich guy to, to like, hey, you know, pay me to use these stones to, I don't know if, because part of me, and I actually wrote a, a, a movie treatment about this, his, feels like his friend Oliver Cowdery could have been the impetus for all of this. Hmm. He definitely plays a big role in it, yeah. Here's what I'm imagining. You have a friend that believes his own bullshit, or at the very least pretends to, mm-hmm. and just got arrested for conning this guy, and he's still running around with these stones, and he still believes he can see into the dirt. And you want to prove him a fool. Hopefully... To knock it out of him. So you go and you get some fucking brass plates <laughs> and, and you fucking hammer in some symbols that look kind of Egyptian and you go and you fucking bury him, right? And in the middle of the night, you go up to Joe's house and you're like, Ooh, it's me, an angel. Go dig up on the hill where the dirt is loose and recently overturned. <laughs> I actually could see, like, like I could buy that more than I could buy. He went into the woods to pray and an angel appeared to him and was like, well, you gotta dig for the secret scriptures, John. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> dig, Joe. You gotta <laughs> dig. Uh, uh, which is the actual fucking story. Yep. Uh, yep. But so he, he, you know, that's what he tells people. If you're just living in his town, what happened is this guy that got arrested last year for fraud came out and was like, hey, uh, me and my friend just translated this religious book. I got a copy right here. And you go, wait, 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 wait. What what are you saying? You you copied some something? And he's like, yeah, off of gold plates. You're like, can I see him? He's like, no, you can't see the gold plates. Uh, okay, Joe. Um, your your book. How did you translate it? Oh, I used my seer stones, same ones I used to see the native treasure. So, real quickly, just an aside, that is the 
kind of like, well, I mean, it's the truth and it's now more the accepted version than not. But when I was raised, we were told it was not a rock and a hat. It was a special set of goggles called the Urim and Thummim. Oh, yeah. I remember this. And he put these on. And when he put on those special glasses, the symbols on the plates would turn into words. And we Translate were themselves. distinctly told the rock in the hat is an anti-Mormon lie. It's just a story. It's not true. Yeah. And now they admit it. Well, they have to. Thank you, Internet. Yeah. Oh, man. Having a bunch of information all available and to to be able to, like, peer review and not right. have it be... Um, uh, like if it's if it's small, then it's just a rumor, and we can bust it, you know, union busting stuff. Right. But if it's if there's a lot of people saying it, it starts to look suspicious. Mm-hmm. I recently uh, had my friend Kyle message me and was like, "I just heard about all this Joseph Smith arrest stuff," and and he's an ex Mormon. I was like, "Wait, you never came across that? You just left the church because it was bullshit? God damn!" <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow, that's funny. You, you, sir, are the exception. Very much so. What do they tell kids about the polygamy? Oh, God will work it out in the next life, Alex. <laughs> the polygamy <laughs> stops on earth, continues in heaven. Oh. Yes. So my father, my father with a dead wife has married and sealed to a second wife. So he now has two in heaven. Oh. He's eternally a polygamist. So she's just chilling she's just waiting Florence. for him, and then they're going to both be... And everybody's uh-huh. cool with this, like the bishops and the yeah, that's elders. Right. And- yeah. They... Uh, uh, absolutely. Anyway. Uh, so, Joseph Smith. Yeah, literally, that's the story they've, I mean, they've had to cop to, and they still stand behind. Uh, uh, two stones in a hat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, uh, so best case scenario from the get go, his story to the public of read my book was insane. Oh yeah. Another important thing to mention with the book is he was selling it to people. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. he published the book of Mormon, but you didn't get it for free. Like you do today. You had to buy it. Yeah. Today they give it away. Then you had to buy it. Uh, uh, Yet and still, and people people bought it. Yeah, people bought it. The part of the Great Awakening, and it was it was it was new. So if you were the kind of person that was like, "Fuck you, mom and dad, your church sucks," right. like this gave you an outlet, um, you know, let you stand apart, but it was still Christian, mm-hmm. right? Still Jesus. So it's not a big leap away from from any other Christian faith. Right. Uh, though though it should be. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Once but like Scientology, you don't you don't get all the good bits till you've been in long enough. Exactly. And oh those good bits. I will say I, I do have to add part of my journey, uh I think the the thing that really uh cement put cement in all the locks to ever opening that door again. Uh the, the book that they consider I mentioned in the beginning, The Pearl of Great Price. Uh, uh, at one point, because Joseph Smith went around saying, I, tra- I translated these Egyptian fucking reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, some guy, his uncle had some papyrus and he was like, Hey, 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 he grabbed it and took it to Joseph Smith's like, Hey, I got this fucking, all this papyrus. It's legit. It's from a fucking tomb in Egypt. Can you translate it? And Joseph's like, fuck yeah, I can. Yeah. And, and Joseph Smith is like, Pearl of Great Price, this is is the story of Abraham in Egypt, the part the Bible didn't tell. <laughs> oh, oh, Bible 2, baby! <laughs> Motherfucker! Fuck oh, yeah! The hubris that he, he must have had. Now see, the when he did that in the early 1800s, there was no Rosetta Stone. Mm-hmm. They hadn't found the Rosetta <laughs> Stone yet. Oh, shit. Oh, that's so good. So he translates this complete thing <laughs> from Egyptian. It's like, yep, that's it. 100% correct. Nailed it. Yep. First used try. my arm and thumb. Same, first try. Same shit I used for the Book of Mormon. I used my seer stones. And then, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, piece yep. of cake. Yeah, just any, any prophet worth his salt can translate that shit, bro. Let me tell you. 
Uh, well, it turns out people who uh, can read hieroglyphics in ancient Egyptian today, thanks to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, a stone tablet containing not only ancient Egyptian, but also Greek, and I believe Aramaic on one side, was it was the other? Anyway, regardless, definitely Greek. Uh, they, they had, that was the codex. It was like, oh shit, now mm-hmm. thanks to this, we've got a translation. We can crack the code. Those papers, those hieroglyphics survive in church archives. And yes. guess what? Everybody who's not born Mormon, who looks at those hieroglyphics and translates them, all get the same result, and they are uh, breathing. It's called a breathing permit. Now, the ancient Egyptians were very bureaucratic, and they believed that you actually need paperwork to breathe in the afterlife. <laughs> not everybody got this paperwork. Interesting. Because it's a caste system. So if you were like the, the, the lowest of the low in Egypt, you don't have a breathing permit. You have to be like a priest or higher. Interesting. Right? So so if you don't have a breathing permit, you're basically a zombie in the afterlife. You're a slave. Right? Uh, uh, but if you're like a pharaoh uh, all the way down to priest, you get a breathing permit. Anyway, that's all this is. It's, it's part of bureaucracy. It's not even unique. There are many right. other breathing permits that are the same shit that you can be like, oh, look, ah, these hieroglyphs match. Um, <laughs> what do you know? Be- because of ancient Egypt. Right. So, like, we actually do have an example of him being a bullshit artist translator, and it's called the Pearl of Great Price. And oh, the oh, church God. has had to distance itself from those hieroglyphics as well. And what mm-hmm. about that? What, is that still scripture, though? Yeah. It is still in their canon, yes. I don't know uh-huh. how much they teach out of it anymore, because I haven't been in a yeah, long time. It's, but it's, they're fa- uh, as far as I know, they're phasing it out. Oh, but it, it is still in their scriptures at the moment. I have a, I have some questions. Question one, I'm, and I'm sorry to circle back, but so marriage is forever and polygamy is okay in the afterlife. So then, but is, can women also have, you know, a bunch of husbands? Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. Oh, you. Women don't have any power. (laughs) Look. You need a god rod if you want the top tier magic powers. I've <laughs> always wanted a god rod, damn it! Yeah. Sorry, Amber, I got more magic voodoo than you. Uh. <sighs> That's what she said. Just oh. seems a little oh, mean. The funny, okay, okay. This, <laughs> this actually, this is a great example of the massage of the Mormon church. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, uh, at the age of 12, they they did their little ceremony and granted me the first level initiation magic Mormon powers, right? Yep. They call it the Aaronic Priesthood, okay? Mm-hmm. So me having the Aaronic Priesthood at 12 is so far more advanced than Amber, who got sealed in the temple and birthed several children. Mm-hmm. I'm still above her in the church's eyes. Yep, uh, he still has... How Even though I go? stopped progressing when I was 12. They don't say <laughs> that there's any hierarchy, though. They don't, there's no public facing that women are no. not as good as men. It's all internal. No, 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 no. no. They don't come out right and say it, no. They, no. That would be a sure nail in their coffin. Yeah. Um, yeah because but they want followers. The other teachings and the setups, like, women don't get the priesthood, period. Like, nope. well. Let me take that back. There's one instance in the temple where women are authorized to act on behalf of the priesthood, but they don't really get the priesthood. Priesthood pro pro tempore. Um, well, it's not even acting in your in your husband's name. It's um, when you go through the temple, you're given um, these rites called the washings and anointings, and you get a new name. And women administer those rights a new name to women. Um, I don't know if that was always the case because I'm not a church historian, but I know now that they do. So that's the only instance where women get to use the priesthood, but they don't actually have the priesthood. What's the priesthood? <laughs> oh, hold on, hold on. We'll get to that, Alex. Are they allowed to administer the ceremony if they're menstruating? <laughs> Uh, ooh, good question. I don't know. I never asked. Because I'm going to say no. Uh, what is the fucking priesthood? I'll tell you what it is, Alex. I get special powers of discernment to know whether or not people are lying. It's the power to act for God, Alex. 
I can act for God. I can bless you if you are sick. Yep. I can anoint food uh, and transmute it as sacrament. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. This is the, his body. Yeah. But only, only bread and water, not wine. Oh, yeah, no. You know what's funny? Okay, this is ba- back to my, my mother's uh, spiral in the Mormon church socially, even though she was a true believer. I don't think at the end, partly because of this bullshit, uh, uh, she couldn't eat whole wheat, right? She was allergic like she's to it. Fucking allergic to bread, like really allergic. Like, trust me, I've inherited some of her allergies, and I ha- saw some jaws drop on some allergists with how allergic to fucking cedar and juniper trees I am. Mm. Three is considered high, and I'm a ten. Oh damn! Anyway, like she was way worse than me. Anyway, yeah. she literally she could not eat wheat. It's going to make her fucking sick as hell. Uh, and, and she would bring her own, she would bake her own thing and bring it to church to get blessed. And whether or not she was able to get her own edible thing blessed completely depended on who the bishop was. Yep. And I saw a bishop change where it went from one guy saying, yes, that's fine. And the next guy said, no you eat the bread we provide or nothing because it's the sacrament and there's no way you could be allergic to it. Bishop Roulette. Oh, you remember too. Ah! Oh yeah. Bishop yeah. Roulette's a huge thing in the church. Oh yeah. So that's, go, oh, go oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. That's not his name. It, it means, it means spinning the wheel. You might get lucky and get a bishop that, you know, uses cognitive thinking, and you might get lucky and get a bishop who is a toe blind or else. Is there, is there, uh, do they move them like the um, Catholics do when they touch boys no. and girls? No. They don't move them. They might, they might uh, uh, make them not bishop anymore, but they're still, like, moving would be on their own accord. Yeah, it's considered a calling in the church. God asks you to take this position and fulfill this position for him. If it's like what I would say federal level churches, like the, not the, the like the ward is what I call state level, the stake, like mm-hmm. your stake president. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if it's federal level, they'll move them. But if it's state yeah. level church stuff, they don't, they don't, that's a calling and you don't move. You just don't. You don't get called again next year. Okay, okay, and they, and you know why, and you know why. But uh, odds are, from what I understand in the stories I've read, uh, that's not going to affect it. As long as you're being an effective leader, they'll go ahead and keep calling you. Yeah, it's hush, usually like hush, a hush five to seven case. year commitment. They don't say that, but that's generally what it comes out to be: is five to seven years. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Delegated to the nuclear family. Instead of like out in the open, a big sex cold, and somebody's going to be bad about that. It seems like they get all the abuse in the home. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's all behind closed doors. Yes. And that's really seems like a, a, a key. One of the one of the many keys to it being wild, wildly successful. It's a very successful yeah. cult. One of the most one of the farthest out because the farther out, the less success. You know, it's more risky. So it's a, it seems like for the amount of risk, a lot of success in this particular cult. Yes, definitely. Yeah, and and we as we alluded to on the weekly show, uh, like something my dad called faith promoting rumors, like in the hallways of church before and after class, the the big lies are propagated. Mm-hmm. Right. Like the church will dodge, like like we like we've talked about, and Amber saying like, "Hey, when I was a kid, it was goggles," and then the church dodges and like, "Okay, yeah, it was fucking rocks," because because there are too many other records co- collaborating it. Uh, uh, the the big lies are oh. all in the hallways, and mm-hmm. and I actually remember having a seminary teacher that was really good at spreading the big lies, uh, and and they moved him. Uh, but he he was he was the one that was like, no, I talked to a return missionary from South America who they, in Colombia and they got shot <laughs> at and he had bullet holes on either side of his white magic underwear garments 
but he never got shot by a bullet. Mm-hmm. Well, they actually had a general authority years ago. And so the general authorities are the, the upper bigwigs, the CEOs of the corporation. Um, they actually had a general authority who before pre-internet days was found to be telling and promoting those faith promoting rumors that were not true and Mm -hmm. and they outed him it was a big scandal i mean never mind that it's all faith promoting rumor and untrue but you know they don't want to go that far yet ah yes lying for the lord lying for the lord uh to, to to get back to some more juicy joseph smith bits uh one of my favorites and this is regarding polygamy which came up earlier which which reminded me of it is uh this this church did not start out with polygamy no Mm-mm. no amazingly polygamy didn't come until it was big and powerful enough for the founder and quote unquote prophet to mm. uh, have his pick of the litter so to speak Oh yeah. Yeah. Including other men's wives. Let's let's make sure that's part of it. Oh, yeah, no, literally like like every fucking other cult, right? This got big enough to where and and the the, the mind voodoo was strong enough to where he could convince people to like no 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 no, I'm going to fuck you. Oh, you've got a husband? Hold on, let me talk to him. Hey buddy, God said I get to fuck your wife. Okay. Oh, not even that. God said you needed to go on a mission. Uh, right. You need to go on a mission and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll get there. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me roll it back. Uh, uh, just a tick. Yeah. It chose Smith's like, Hey, uh, God saying that uh, things should be like old Testament Abrahamic days. And mm-hmm. I should have more than one wife to, you know, really, have enough kids to brainwash i mean teach mm-hmm. uh, up into the church and uh uh even on the 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 <laughs> the fucking church's official website if you go to the timeline it is may to july 1843 emma smith joseph's wife consented to several of joseph smith's plural, mar- plural marriages but struggled to accept the practice and then july 12th the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 132 was dictated. So do you, do you know how, the story behind that, Dan? I, I, I would like to hear it again. Ah, uh, okay. So, turns out that uh, Joseph and Emma, his wife, had taken in some orphans and were kind of just raising them as part of their family. And they were servants for the family, essentially. And Joseph's a little dingly hopper was a little too excited by this prospect. And God told him that these women um, needed to be part of his family. Harem, family. He was supposed to marry them into the family and they were supposed to be his wives. And so he was essentially having an affair and sleeping around on Emma. And when she found out, because hello, small town, everybody knows everything. This revelation was received that absolved him from any kind of sin, because this was God's commandment that he take on these girls and sleep with them. But, you know, Emma, you need to just accept it. Like if you don't accept it, I'll remove you from your place is what God told her. So, Doctrine and Covenants 132 is one of the ones I point to uh, when, whenever I'm talking in earnest to people who are curious about why I think it's such a farce and, and, and the evidence behind the farce. And it's all there on the fucking paper, yep. right? Like, if you get the Mormons to give you a book, you can read D&C 132, but read it in the context of which we're talking about. Mm-hmm. That the church even admits in its own timeline. Yep. Its own timeline is, is like, Joseph Smith's wife got all uppity about the plural marriage thing. And then he gets up in front of the entire church as their prophet, as the voice of God. And you can read it yourself. It's boring. 
But go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. He basically says, and I'm not fucking making this up. I'm just summarizing. Look, God's marriages are different than the government marriages. Mm -hmm. God marriage is forever. And God said marriage should be like Abraham days. When We're to restore all things. Got to go back to the old timey things when guys married lots of women. Straight to hell. And you know what? If you're not on board with this, if anybody's not on board with this, you're going straight to hell. If yeah. my wife isn't on board with this, the one I already have, guess what? Baby, straight to hell. I can't save you. Yeah, I can't sorry. save you. See you, see you in sorry. the next life. <laughs> Maybe. God was like, Abraham, Sarah, got to have another wife in Hagar. What did Sarah do? She was like, yup, cool. God said it's I. Fucking hell. It's, yep. it's, it's all right there. It's all right there. And, and I didn't make it up. I just gave it a goofy summary. Uh, all right. It's, it, he, he hammers it in Wonderful. over and over with many different examples. Yeah. Uh, and, and at, at one point, and this is Doctrine and Covenants 132, boy, verse 52, I'm going to read verbatim. Trigger warning for any of you out there. And let mine handmaid Emma Smith receive all those that have been given unto my servant Joseph and who are virtuous and pure before me. And those who are not pure and have said they were pure shall be destroyed, saith the Lord God. For I am the Lord thy God, and ye shall obey my voice. And I give unto my servant Joseph that he shall be made ruler over many things. For he hath been faithful over a few things, and from henceforth I will strengthen him. And I command mine handmaid Emma Smith to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God and, and will destroy her if she abide not by my law. Yeah, I don't have to continue. I don't have to continue. But it goes on. It goes on. That's in their book. And I don't know who can read that, understanding the context. And not be repulsed. Yeah. Well, and, and that's why they don't teach us the context. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we, if once you find out the context, you start to question and they don't want you questioning anything. Mm. You know, I, I wish, don't but I, you know, I, was just a kid. I did have a lot of questions as a kid and, and, but later, this is one of the ones that. Uh, 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 we come across. I came across and was like, "Okay, nope. Here it is, right here." Yeah. If you're not reading this under the the brainwash mindset of having been born in it, this is very obviously a man manipulating his wife into polyamory. He's absolutely abusing her into it. It's not even manipulation. He's abusing her. Holy shit. Like, yeah, right? This is Harvey Weinstein shit. Yep. You want... Mm -hmm. He's literally threatening eternal damnation. And death. Like, and death. <laughs> and, they, and he has the power. He has the authority to, to make that true for them. And it's true. For, it is true for them. Yeah, no, I, I feel sorry for Emma Smith. I really do. I think she got into it and didn't even know what she was getting into. Well, I mean, and you're just a woman in 1832 getting married, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, she had no idea what was really going to happen. He was such a driver. Now, do you... I don't know. Do you know what happened to her after he died? Um. So, the church split after his death. Um, Brigham... She, oh, so... She, she went with the, 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 the son? Yes. She and his sons stayed in um, the Midwest, wherever they were, because the name is escaping me at the moment. Missouri. They stayed where they were um, and felt that, they, that the authority of the prophetship would come to his son. Brigham Young said, no, it comes to me. Um, as head of the Quorum of the Twelve or whatever the hell it was. And so he, yeah, he took all the people that supported him and um, they moved to Utah. 
And a lot of that was because they were in a lot of trouble um, for doing things like burning printing presses and like Mm -hmm. they were getting in so much trouble and the authorities and the people were chasing them out of there because they were so dishonest in their dealings, Uh, which is not the official story. Of course, they got run out of Bainbridge, New York. They got run out of everywhere. They got, they got run out of New York. They got run out of Kirtland, Ohio. Yep. They got run out of, uh, Nauvoo, Missouri, and then they ended up in far west Illinois. Nauvoo, Illinois. Was Nauvoo in Illinois? Yeah, Nauvoo is in uh, Illinois. But they were run out of there, so. Regardless, like, they got run out of several places uh, uh, before finally, uh, I mean, at one point, they tried to make a bank, like, like shit goes really off the rails. It, like, like I don't want to get into to, to all the shit, because we could Make go on for another ninety minutes. That's how much oh, bullshit. Once this church gets off the ground, once this church has gotten off the ground to the point, okay, like he grew this church from like I'm selling this book to oh, easy, a yeah. point where he could literally say to his wife with a straight face, "I'm going to marry that child we adopted, and you ain't gonna say shit." Yep. And just like mm-hmm. Shelly Miscavige not being seen in public, yeah, fell in line. What's she gonna do, especially in the 1800s? 1800s, yeah. Like it's there's no forensics detective work. Like she disappears, nobody's gonna miss her. Uh, she left, officer. I don't know where she went. Oh, okay, right, right. Well, I wouldn't well, want to doubt the word of a fine man like yourself with a penis and all, and even with a white skin color. Plus, all his friends were the were the. All of his friends were the legal authorities in all of the places they lived. So, yeah, yeah, he was big. He was big on on befriending them. Uh, he he got arrested because he had his own newspaper. The local paper was printing shit about him and the church that he didn't like. Uh, because the truth, know, in other words, seems bad. Yeah, they had a lot of shit to hide. That's why they kept having to move, right? Because yep. let me tell you, when you're just really good people and you're contributing to the community, people don't attack you. What? And force you to leave. Okay? I'm sorry. They don't. <laughs> Think about the logic of that to yourselves for a second. You've got a neighbor that's really kind and generous. What do you do? Oh, you run them out of town, of course. Right. Just like the Hare Krishnas, we as humans feel a need to give back. When we're given to. Yeah. That's in all of us. Okay. So the whole Mormon uh, narrative falls flat on his face when you realize that they wouldn't have been driven from the very first town if they were the kind, loving, giving people they claim to have been at the start. Right. That they claim to be now. If that was the case, nobody drives the nice guy. Nobody drives Ned Flanders from town. Right. We want more of them. You want more, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so, so a newspaper's printing the truth about them. They started their own paper to print the opposite. They had like their Fox News, Mormon News right. kind of thing going. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, uh, but he and uh, a group of other Mormons actually destroyed the the, the printing press, and uh, so he was arrested, right? And mm-hmm. and. When a mob came, they say to to kill him. I believe it because he was so scared. He jumped out of the second story window, broke his leg, and they killed him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. Like like Ned Flanders didn't didn't die by, by firing squad, right? <laughs> just up and up until the end, it it, it just got. He really just abused his power more and more and more. And if you, if you mm-hmm. approach it from a neutral standpoint of, okay, there was a religion started. Let's look at the history of its growth in this man. I don't see how you could apply critical thinking and not come to the conclusion that this guy, whether he believed it or not, uh, was really full of it. Really just every step of the way. And I tend to lean towards he knew it was a fraud because of the what he said about polygamy into his wife. 
Oh, he absolutely did know. To me, yeah. betrays like his motive, like right, like yeah, he's got a motive. And then it's very selfish and it's very transparent to us now. Right. But you got to realize in 1830s in a church pew. Holy shit. That's that's the that's fucking the real deal. Well, I mean, it still happens today. We still have organizations that are cult like, even if they yeah. aren't cults, that mm. suck people in like that and yeah. become their whole lives. Yep. Yep. I mean, we just saw in the news that fucking cult with the, the actress from Smallville. Right. Like that dude, that dude, she was a successful actress on TV and she got sucked into a sex cult. Now he did make her top tier slave. She was right. still a slave. Yep. How crazy is that? Like, you're my slave, but I'll give you some power over the other slaves. Okay, great. I mean, that's what we all want, right? She's not crazy. That's human mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, you read reports about the Holocaust camps in World War II. It was the the capos that did some of the most sadistic shit. The, Absolutely, the Jews that were given power over the other Jews. The Germans just had to encourage it. They didn't have to do it themselves, right? It's it, human human psychology is such a worthwhile thing to study and learn. Uh, uh, so today, in the Mormon Church, thanks to things like the internet. Uh, I, I came across a thing called the Faith Crisis Report of 2013, and I wanted to, to, to cap off this discussion uh, by bringing up uh, this report. It was not done by the official church. It was done by church members who were hoping to pitch it to the church to try and and help the bleeding, to stop the bleeding of people leaving the church. because. Things, I mean, we didn't even we didn't even go over things like uh, black people not being given the priesthood till the seventies. That that mythical priesthood magic powers I was given at twelve. Well, right. You're black, you don't get them. You're like a woman, you don't get them because that's to the church that was your status. Yeah, that happened in my lifetime. Like I don't yeah. remember it, but it happened while I was a little kid, so it wasn't yeah. very long ago. Right. And like uh, the kid i knew when i was a teenager that killed himself uh they're they're currently in the problem of homosexuality right mm-hmm. like they completely condemn it but the society doesn't and society has shifted and and they're trying to you know deal with and overcome that that's a big one right now i mean i think that a lot of christian churches do suffer with the the race and the um homosexuality and the numbers <laughs> just yeah straight up. absolutely but the mormons are just so i don't know they're so a- adamant this is the the way this is the only way you're so good at it well they pitch yeah they pitch a, a specific like god has a very specific plan and you have to follow these specific criteria right. so anybody mm-hmm. who's not following the mormon path is at a default wrong there's different levels of wrong. You know, obviously, like a Baptist following Christ uh, isn't as wrong as a Hindu, or right. especially not as wrong as an atheist. Oh, those dirty oh, fucking boy. atheists. Um, <laughs> the worst. The worst. Uh, uh, but I wanted to, to quote part of this faith crisis report. Uh, they had they, enlisting their reasons to focus on faith crisis which uh, they define as a state of intense emotional and spiritual distress resulting from the discovery of church history facts that do not align (laughs) with the traditional LDS narrative. This distress results in members losing faith in some or all foundational truth claims of the LDS church (laughs) and in the church itself. Now that's verbatim. I didn't write that. But it really sums up this episode, right? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Amen. Uh, and and uh, uh, the the reasons number one, our data show a significant number of church leaders (parentheses) who have traditionally been stalwart, active, and highly committed (end parentheses) are leaving the church or lapsing or lapsing into long term inactivity, resulting in a void of local leadership. Two, when longtime members go inactive as a result of faith crisis, 
a large ripple effect is created within their families, wards, and stakes. This ripple effect that causes others to lose faith may not be detected for months or even years from the point of first exposure. Three, not addressing the faith crisis issue will compound the challenge for future leaders and future generations of members. And finally, four, while it is while it was not uncommon in our recent past for, quote, left-leaning individuals, unquote, to, to struggle in their faith over doctrinal issues such as blacks and the priesthood or gays, our data suggests an increasingly number of individuals and families from the, quote, middle, end quote, are losing faith and reducing or eliminating church activity as a result of faith crisis. <laughs> not the middle. Faith crisis. The middles. They're getting to the middles. So they're worried. Oh yeah, they're worried. These guys, yeah, these members are worried. Yep. The church has its mm. fingers in their ears. I think they're starting to see the writing on the wall as the as more and more policies and procedures get changed. Um, in the temple, women no longer have to covenant to obey their husbands, apparently. So, you know, progress. Whoa. We're in, what, 2024? Wait, are you, guys, you guys are progressive now. Well, not you guys. <laughs> I know, they're really... Well, that's what we saw with uh, uh, the civil rights movement. In the 60s, there was a civil rights movement in the U.S. to get mm-hmm. the black people equal rights. And in the 70s, the church was like, okay, I guess guess we will. So they're Mm -hmm. like 10 years later. But they haven't budged on homosexuality. Well, they are a little teeny bit. Not much. Not enough for it to really mean. And really, it's meaningless because we know their original stance is that gender is eternal and marriage is eternal. So Mm -hmm. you don't Mm -hmm. fit those two designated categories it doesn't matter you could do whatever you want here on this world because the next life you won't get to do it so whatever progress they seemingly make now they have not changed any of their eternal doctrines well it's a uh, it's wild it, i'm always 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 fascinated by cults and this is the biggest baddest one I've ever encountered. Most so successful. successful. <laughs> they just they knew they know how to do it. We could we could make a song like Bad Bad Loy, Leroy Brown, but like Bad Bad Joseph Smith. King of all the goddamn <laughs> bullshit. No, oh, he is. He's a oh, good one. Anyhow, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, you, Amber, coming by and and sharing all of your knowledge and insight and. And Professor Anytime. Gringard, I got uh, lots of it. I, Professor, Professor, I, I appreciate you coming by as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's been a great time. I feel like we could probably go another ninety minutes, but uh, easily. Uh, that's, that's that's about as as much time as I have set aside for the day. <laughs> well, I think we've given the people enough to chew on. That's for sure. I'll have plenty of Excellent. links in the episode description. And if you've got some questions, uh, you can always reach out to us at halfcocktails at gmail.com or you can send a message or a voicemail to 443-499-8253. And uh, if if you did enjoy this show and you, you know somebody that needs to hear what we had to talk about, please like, share, subscribe, rate. Thanks for sticking around to the end, but we do got to go uh, for now. Uh, be well, and let's uh, let's try a little bit of critical thinking in the social contract. Uh, Amber, uh, Professor, you got any parting words? Hmm, parting words. Yeah, just like re- read a little bit. I, I don't know who who's our audience. Is it the the people who got out? Good good thing. Um, that's great. You you did it. Um, that was a, a huge moment in your life. From what I hear, you two. Uh, it was it was huge for you. So those of you listening that already got out of there, um, you know, con- congratulations! You broke broken free uh, from your self self imprisonment <laughs> and abuse. Um, and those of you who are you still working on it, you know, um, 
thanks thanks for listening if you're thinking up like all the uh the things to say that make you upset about us i actually would would be totally cool to hear them uh so reach out talk to us talk to people yeah. don't don't isolate and Absolutely. definitely talk to people yeah. that are out of the church yeah have to have those conversations and listen to what your heart's saying because if it feels like oh wait a second this is abuse oh, then I, it might just be abuse and if you're in the mormon church it is yeah hey right. yeah. well yeah. to borrow the words of another favorite podcaster Stay away from cults, folks. <laughs> yeah. No joke. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now things are ending. It's time to go. No more to get through. Thanks for listening. That's our show. Ain't affectation. Oh, we're just leaving you half cocked. Half cocked. Half cocked. Had a good time talking today But even best times eventually they fade away Ain't adjuration, we're just leaving half-cocked